One of the uh, features that, that I like about a, a DVR, even it's true with the VCR too, is the, the fast forward uh, feature. So whenever I record a television program, I can push that button, quickly skip over commercials or, or whatever part of the program I'm not really interested in watching. And, and it really is a great time saver. Uh, in a month or so, I'll be recording some football games. These are not Packer games. These are the football games. And, and with the help of fast forward button, I can usually watch a game that they spent three hours broadcasting in 45 minutes maybe. Um, saves a lot of time. Packer games you watch for the full three hours. <laughs> My thought is, folks, wouldn't it be great if life came with a fast forward button? Whenever we encountered a, a part of life we found unpleasant, we could just push fast forward and, and go through that experience, uh, I don't know, four, eight, 32 times uh, the normal speed. So you, you get a head cold and you push the button and within a few hours you, you feel great again. Uh, a loved one dies, you push the button and instead of grieving, for months, you're, you're fine within a few days. Or maybe on the other side of the coin, you're, you're waiting for, for something good to happen. Uh, this doesn't happen many times, but I know it does sometimes. You're, you're a kid or you're a parent and you really want school to, to start. You can't wait to get back into that. Uh, and you push the button and those next three weeks go by in just a few hours. And it's the first day of school. Or you're, you're sitting in the pew this morning, not very interested in the sermon. So you push the fast forward button, and before you know it, the worship team is back on the platform, leading us in the closing song. That would be the nap, even, wouldn't it? A wonderful option if we had fast forward button in life. Maybe. But, but folks, sometimes we're tempted to fast forward, to push things ahead, to take shortcuts, when that's not what God desires. And when we choose to do that, we often end up missing some important things the Lord has for us. Today, our journey through the book of 1 Samuel brings us to chapter 24. And if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there, uh, 1 Samuel 24, page 246, if you're using the, the black one in the rack there, 1 Samuel chapter 24. 22 verses in this chapter. Here we see David resisting the temptation to push that fast forward button and become the king of Israel before it was God's time. And let's just pause and pray the Lord would speak to us uh, through his word this morning and that we would hear and, and heed what he has to say to us. Well, Father, once again, we thank you for the Bible, which is the word of God, which is true in, in all that it affirms and all that it teaches us. And Lord, today we ask that uh, these words would not just be reminding us of things that happened a long time ago, but they would be words which speak to our lives today and what we're going to do and attitudes we're going to have and words we're going to speak even uh, this very day. Thanks, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, two weeks ago, we were in 1 Samuel 23, and there we left David, uh, again, the young man who's been chosen by God to be the new king of Israel. <laughs> David's on the run from Saul, the current king, who wants to kill him. Uh, David had been betrayed by people in a nearby town, and yet just as it seems that Saul is about to capture and kill David, uh, end of chapter 23, verses 27, 28, a messenger came to Saul saying, Come quickly, because the Philistines have raided the land. So Saul broke off his pursuit of David, and went home to engage the Philistines. Now, as we've gone through 1 Samuel, we've seen that things that happen don't just happen. 
The Lord apparently inspired the Philistine raid in some way just to divert Saul's attention and make sure he does not capture David. Verse 29, from there David went up and stayed in the strongholds of En Gedi. David is learning that his real stronghold is not the fortress of En Gedi. His real stronghold is the Lord. God is the mighty fortress where he will always find refuge. Uh, years later, David would compose a song about his escape from Saul. Uh, 2 Samuel 22, verses 2 and 3, he writes, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock, where I seek refuge, my, my shield, uh, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. Friends, as we go through life, I, I hope we're learning that the Lord is indeed the one who we can turn uh, for refuge and salvation. But it, it's David's growing faith in the Lord that gives us a, a context for what happens next, which is our text today, uh, 1 Samuel 24, verses 1 and 2. When Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the wilderness near En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 of Israel's fit young men and went, went to look for David and his men in front of uh, the rocks of the wild goats. David's little army consists of somewhere between 400 and 600 men. Saul has 3,000. Saul's forces are clearly superior. Verse 3, when Saul came to the sheep pens along the road, a cave was there, and he went to relieve himself. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Now again, the things that happen in 1 Samuel don't just happen. There were dozens of caves in that area. Why would Saul choose this particular cave to use as a restroom? Well, because of God's purpose and plan. N knowing Saul is in the cave by himself with the 3,000 men outside, David's men are ecstatic. Ver verse 4, they said to him, Look, this is the day the Lord told you about. I will hand your enemy over to you so you can do to him whatever you desire. His men anticipate that David is going to sneak up and kill Saul. Why wouldn't he? Saul has been trying to kill David for years. For years. David could end, it, end all this in just a split second. And, and they assume that once Saul is dead, his forces will join in, in acclaiming David as the new king, and they're going to be able to go back home to their families and live normal lives. If David would just kill Saul right now. However, that is not what David is going to do. Da David, verse uh, 4, continuing, David got up and secretly cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Saul had lightly taken off his, the robe, and, and, and this is David's way of sending Saul a message. The king's robe stood for uh, his royal authority, and by cutting it, David is apparently saying, I'm going to cut you off from the kingdom. You will no longer be king. I will be. Now, this taunting symbol seems pretty mild compared to killing Saul, but still David is conscience-stricken. He feels guilty now about cutting the king's robe. His men are apparently saying, David, why didn't, you, why didn't you slit Saul's throat instead of his robe? He says to them, verse 6, I swear before the Lord, I would never do such a thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed. David knows that the Lord has anointed or chosen him to be the new king. But Saul is still in that role. David is determined to do nothing to grab onto the throne and take it away from Saul. He's committed to having God give the throne to him. 
not to take it for himself. So David is content to wait, not fast forward. He's content to wait even in a cave for that time when the Lord will make him king. Verse 7, when these, with these words, David persuaded his men, and he did not let them rise up against Saul. Uh, many, many versions say uh, David restrained his men. In, in Hebrew, literally, it says David cut into them. So I think the NIV probably hits it on the head when it says David sharply rebuked them. Uh, they want to kill Saul. David says, you will do no such thing. Continuing verse 7, then Saul left the cave and went on his way. Uh, but David decides uh, is it, this is a good time to send Saul a little message, a little different message. Apparently when Saul is a safe distance away, safe that is for David, uh, David calls out to the king. Verse 9, why do you listen to the words of people who say, look, David intends to harm you? And then, holding up the corner of the king's robe, he says, you can see with your own eyes that the Lord has handed you over to me today in the cave. Someone advised me to kill you, but I took pity on you and said, I won't lift my hand against my Lord, since he is the Lord's anointed. Look, my father, look at the corner of your robe in my hand, for I cut it off, but I did not kill you. Recognize I've committed no crime or rebellion. I haven't sinned against you, even though you are hunting me down to take my life. In other words, David is saying, I am innocent and I pose zero threat to you or your throne. Uh, David then says in verse 12 that the Lord is our judge. He's going to decide uh, this conflict between us, but I am not going to harm you. He, he quotes a proverb, not a proverb in the Bible, but one known in Israel in, in verse 13. Wickedness comes from wicked people, meaning evil deeds reveal a person's evil heart. His message is, I'm not trying to kill you, Saul, but you're trying to kill me. If, if there's a guilty person, a wicked person in this conflict, it's not me, Saul. It's you. David concludes in verse 15, May the Lord be judge and decide between you and me. May he take notice and plead my case and deliver me from you. Saul finds David's words and, and, and David's decision to spare his life very persuasive. He's moved to tears. Verse 17, Saul said to David, You are more righteous than I, for, for you've done what is good to me, though I've done what is evil to you. Saul, at, at least for the moment, realizes David is not his enemy. He tells him, verse 19, May the Lord repay you with good for what you've done for me today. But Saul acknowledges something even more important. He says to David, verse 20, now I know for certain you will be king, and the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. And then, just like Jonathan, Saul asks David to promise that when he becomes king, David, when you become king, please do not take revenge and kill my family and my relatives. Throughout history, that's how uh, a new king often treats the old king's family, just kills them all. D David, however, agrees to not harm Saul's family. A and at that point, verse 22, Saul and his army return home to Gilgal. Well, David is, and his men return to their, their fort in En Gedi. Despite Saul's words, David knows <laughs> that this is not over. Unfortunately, the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and, and he had become a, a wicked man. A and David knows wicked people tend to do wicked things, and they don't always keep their word. A and though he is no doubt grateful that Saul is not currently pursuing him, David knows this time of peace is unlikely to last. And in the chapters ahead, we'll see that is indeed the case. Okay, that's the text. So what is the Lord saying to us? 
through this chapter? Well, I can think of at least three things. David's decision to not kill Saul and immediately gain the throne for himself reminds us, first of all, that we too should honor the king. David's vow to, to never raise his hand against the Lord's anointed is, is, in some sense, a model for us. Now, obviously, we do not live in ancient Israel, and uh, we have no king that God has chosen to reign over us. However, 1 Peter 2.17 says Christians are to honor the emperor. And, and Romans 13.1 says that every political authority has been established by God. And if the Lord wanted the early Christians to honor Emperor Nero, who was not a nice man at all, I think we certainly should be honoring the American president, whether his name is Obama or Trump. Now, that doesn't mean you can't disagree with them. It doesn't mean you can't criticize them. But you need to honor the one who holds that office. Now, I believe there are situations when political rulers forfeit their given authority. Um, in my opinion, it was proper for uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer to be involved in a plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. Certainly a case can be made that it was right for the American patriots to take up arms in 1776 to free themselves from the authority of King George, who had abused his authority. Yet, those are extreme cases, and in general, Christians today should honor their political leaders. They don't have to agree with them, they're free to criticize them, but they need to honor those leaders. And as long as there are peaceful means to remove a leader who has failed to do his job well, meaning as long as there are elections, it is difficult to believe that violent means such as assassination or revolution are appropriate. David's decision to honor God's anointed king also points us to an even more important responsibility. Remember, Saul and, and then David were, were God's appointed, uh, I'm sorry, God's anointed rulers. They were messiahs with that lowercase m. Jesus is God's anointed ruler, messiah with a, a capital M, is, and it is, is indeed the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is always, always our responsibility to honor and obey this true king. That, in fact, should be our priority each and every day, to honor the true king. May God fill our minds and hearts with a desire to never dishonor the King of kings, Jesus the Messiah. Honor the king. Secondly, David reminds us that we should not take revenge. In the Solid Joy's devotional a few weeks ago, John Piper noted that there are three reasons why Christians are not to take revenge. Uh, first of all, he says we should forgive those who have wronged us because we have experienced God's forgiveness through Jesus. That's spelled out for us in Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate for one another, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven us. Now, exactly what forgiveness means in a situation where the person who has harmed us refuses to apologize and appears to feel no remorse, it's not always easy to figure out what forgiveness looks like in those situations. However, the basic thought is because we have been forgiven, we are empowered to forgive. We should be doing that. Along with this, secondly, the Bible contains some pretty severe warnings to those who refuse to forgive. As Jesus ends the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 15, he says, if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. 
Remember part of the prayer is for, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And then, again, we, we haven't memorized this part usually, but he adds in verse 15, if you refuse to give, forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Again, understanding what, what this verse means probably takes a little work. I think Jesus is saying that a refusal to forgive is an, in, is an indication that someone may not have genuine faith in Jesus Christ. But what is clear is that anyone who is focused on getting revenge should realize that his or her attitude is very displeasing to the Lord. That would be the bottom line. If you have a desire for revenge, if you're unwilling to forgive, that attitude is not pleasing to God. And then a third reason why Christians should not seek revenge is because that's God's job, not ours. The, the Lord promises to make sure there will ultimately be justice. David was willing to let God settle his conflict with Saul. And he was confident that in the end, justice would be done. For us, Romans 12, 19 says, Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Now, let me be clear. The, the, the exhortations that God gives us to forgive and, and the warnings he gives about what happens if we fail to forgive. That ought to be enough to keep us from ever seeking revenge. But I think the Lord gives us this third reason because sometimes, sometimes when someone has hurt us really deeply, we find it just too hard to forgive. Oh, oh I believe eventually the Lord will give us the grace to do so, but at that particular point, we, we, just, we just aren't able to do it. And yet, even then, we should not let thoughts of taking revenge enter our mind. Because revenge is not our job. It is God's. No one's going to get away with anything. Th those sins that have been done against you... <laughs> Will, will be paid for. They will either be paid for by Jesus on the cross or they will be paid for by that person who's committed those sins. No, we should not relish the thought of someone who has hurt us getting what they, res what they deserve. <laughs> uh, the love your enemies command Jesus gave prohibits us from doing that. Yet we should be able to dismiss any thoughts of revenge, and we should be able to sleep peacefully at night knowing that the Lord has promised to take care of things and make things right. That's not our job. Friends, I, I, I'm a realist. I know that if someone hurts you or someone hurts someone you deeply love, I, I know it's not easy to forgive. And, and I know that temptation to take revenge can be very real. Well, most of us aren't thinking about hiring a hitman or anything like that, but, but we, we, we do have thoughts about how we might be able to somehow get back at the person who is making life kind of miserable for us right now. My word to you, friend, is don't go there. Don't go there. You, you, you don't have to go there. God will take care of it. He will make things right. If, if not in this life, certainly in the next. And any effort you make to take revenge will likely hurt you far more than it hurts the other person. Any effort you take to, to get revenge is likely going to hurt you more than it hurts the other person. 
Honor the king, don't take revenge. Thirdly, David reminds us to be patient and not try to push that fast forward button. This takes us back to where we started this morning. The Lord had promised David that, that one day he would be king. Saul would fall and David would rise to the throne. David had an opportunity to make that happen that day in the cave, but, but he refused to do so. He, he wanted to become king when God gave him the throne rather than grab the throne for himself. It would, it would apparently be about five more years before David actually became king. That may not seem like a long time, but when you're living in caves, five years is plenty long. It, it was very tempting to push that fast-forward button and, and make those five years turn into five seconds. Saul's gone. David, you're the new king. Yet David was committed to being patient to following God's timetable instead of his own. And friends, today we should want to do that as well. Follow God's timetable instead of our own. Doing so will not always take us on the easy path. In fact, sometimes it's the more difficult path. Yet it is, that is the path God has chosen for us, and thus it certainly is the best path. The path might bring us adversity, discomfort, even suffering. Yet the Lord will use those things to strengthen our souls, draw us closer to himself, and help us become the men and women he's called us to be. Friends, I, I realize that the main reason I'm tempted to push the fast-forward button sometimes is because I tend to make my own comfort and my convenience a pretty high priority. And slowly but surely, I'm learning that as long as I'm doing that, as long as my priority is my comfort and convenience, <laughs> I'm going to miss out on some things that the Lord wants for me. It's, it's not always easy, folks, <laughs> to know when, when God wants us to be patient and wait, and, and when he wants us to push ahead. Think of my friend Joe, for example. You know, he's been working at a, a new job for about, again, you don't know Joe, but he's been working at this new job for about six months, and, and it's just not what he had, he had hoped. And, and so he's thinking about quitting and, and finding something different. However, he, he wants to make sure he, he's doing what the Lord wants him to do. So Joe asks me, Dan, I, I don't know if I should just be patient, hang in there, and, and see if the job gets better, or if I should quit to, and, and move on. What, what do you think God wants me to do? My response is this. Well, Joe, I don't know. <laughs> Not an easy question, but, but here are some things to keep in mind. Number one, pray that the Lord will make his will clear to you. Honest prayers expressing, uh, expressed to the Lord, asking for wisdom, <laughs> that's never a bad idea. Pray, ask God for wisdom. Uh, to, secondly, th then ask yourself, what, what are my motives for wanting to make this change? Is it all about my comfort and my convenience? <laughs> if so, recalculate. Ask yourself, will this change enable me to honor the Lord in, in better ways? If so, quit today. If not, maybe you need to wait. Thirdly, ask, am I cutting any ethical corners by quitting? For example, did, did you make a promise that you're staying at the job for a year? Now, even if that promise is not legally binding, the Lord still expects us to keep our word. And fourth, ask yourself, is this something I'm trying to force? No, we should not just sit back and wait for things to happen, but sometimes we try to force things which aren't intended to happen. 
in, in this particular case, a good question, Joe, is do you, do you have another job opportunity? Or, or are you going to quit and expect God to provide another job for you when maybe this is the one uh, where he wants you to be? If a door is closed, it's often good to try and open it to, to see if the door is locked. But if the door is locked, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to keep trying to break it down. Uh, friends, Aristotle, the uh, ancient Greek philosopher, said, Patience is bitter, but its fruit is sweet. And indeed, wise people from every culture and religion and ideology recognize the value of patience. Patience is a good thing. For us as Christians, patience is really an expression of trust, of faith. It is believing that God's timetable is better than our own. And thus, for Christians, patience is not just a willingness to wait, but involves waiting with confident expectation, waiting with joy, knowing that the Lord's plan for our lives always includes what is for his glory and what is for our ultimate good. Oh, oh it's not easy to be patient. It's not easy. But... But when we are patient, it is a wonderful expression of our trust in the Lord, an indication that we really do believe his promises. And when by God's grace we practice patience today and in the days ahead, the Lord will often use that to strengthen our souls. Patience helps us grow stronger. The, the Lord will often use that to encourage other Christians around us when they see our patience. And our patience will also quietly proclaim to the watching world, I'm not going to try to push the fast forward button in life. Because God, <laughs> the true God, the God of the Bible, he is someone I trust. Someone you can trust. May the Lord help us to avoid that temptation of pushing that fast forward but button and instead patiently trust in the Lord.